Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon in Nairobi. Um, it's good to see um, a few of you still joining us today. Welcome to those. Oh, also, I see someone's from Hamburg, so outside of Nairobi as well. Uh, thanks for joining us for this session, um, TCFD 101. So it's getting started with climate-related financial reporting um, hosted jointly with the Nairobi Securities Exchange. So thank you to the exchange for hosting us today. Um, I, just to get started, I'll just ask Vanina to pass us on to the next slide, please. Oh, I have control. Sorry, Vanina. I didn't realize. <laughs> um, just to introduce um, ourselves today, um, uh, you have two hosts with you today. So myself, I'm Tiffany Grabsky. I'm the head of the UNSSE uh, Academy. And then I'm joined today also with Evan Guy, who is the Senior Global Policy Manager uh, for Sustainable Finance at CDP. And together um, we host this training on uh, TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, and how you um, can make use of these recommendations for your own disclosures. Um, we're going to dive straight into the training today. Um, we don't have any opening remarks, um, but I would like to just remind you all that um, we'd love to hear from you in uh, the chat. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, we'd like to know uh, maybe where you're coming from geographically, but also maybe what sector you're working in that helps us kind of understand where you're all working and how we can best tailor our training to all of you today. Um, what we're looking to cover today, as a reminder, the 101 session is really introducing uh, the TCFD. Uh, so in this first hour, we're going to talk about um, climate risks and opportunities, what those are and how they can impact financial stability and reporting. Uh, we're also then going to look at how that leads into to our reporting and our disclosure uh, by looking at the global and local reporting landscape. And then finally, um, we'll provide a bit of an overview of what are these recommended disclosures, where does the TCFD come from and how can you make use of that? So that's really kind of setting the stage and introducing the topic. We'll take a break around the halfway point for five minutes, um, just to give you a moment to maybe stand up and stretch and grab perhaps a coffee or a tea. Um, and then in the second hour, what we're going to be looking at is how do you get started on this? So we'll go through some practical steps for implementation. Um, we'll look at a phased implementation approach, and then we'll do an exercise together so that you can start looking at your company's disclosure and identifying where you are in this process and how you can start moving forward. Um, we'll leave you with um, additional resources uh, that you can use as you continue on your learning journey. Um, and we might have time, hopefully, um, since we didn't have uh, any opening remarks, I think we should have some time um, at the end for some Q&A. Um, so you're all currently muted, um, but at the end, if we have time for Q&A, we will be able to unmute any of you who want to ask a question. Um, so just a few housekeeping um, uh, points. Um, as mentioned, uh, as many of you have already, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, in the chat box. Um, and we love to know kind of what industry particularly you're working on, uh, as that helps us understand um, what we need to explain uh, in more detail or additional um, examples we might want to provide. Um, and also just to note, if you do have any questions, so we recommend putting those questions in the Q&A box. Um, that's because in the chat box, sometimes they can get lost amongst all the comments. So if you put them in the Q&A box, we can make sure to get to those questions. Um, we are hoping for Q&A at the end. Um, however, sometimes we get stuck on questions during the session. So please don't hold your question till the end. Um, if you have a question, as soon as it pops into your head, please just feel free to uh, put that in the Q&A box and we'll get to it um, as soon as we can. Um, as mentioned, we'll have a short break halfway through. It's just five minutes though. So please be prompt in returning. Um, and then finally, um, uh, all our presentation materials, so this uh, PowerPoint that you're seeing on your screen now, uh, this will be shared with you um, at the end of the session. So you will receive this PowerPoint and included in it is all the links to all the resources that we're discussing uh, throughout this training. Um, so just um, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the Zoom platform. Um, the audio settings on the left, you are all currently on mute. Uh, that's just because of the way we've set up the webinar. However, um, at the end of the session in the Q&A, if you would like to ask us a question, you can use the little raise hand emoji. And when you raise your hand, we can unmute you and then you can ask your question. Um, but during the, the presentation, we will not unmute anyone. Um, so uh, the raise hand function is not very useful for you throughout the 
training session, rather use the chat box if you have any logistical concerns or pop any questions in the Q&A box if you have questions uh, throughout the session. Okay, so to give you uh, a brief overview of this training that we're providing for you today, uh, we're in that um, dark blue box, TCFD 101. Uh, so this live workshop is looking at getting you started with climate-related financial reporting. As I just went through in our agenda, we're really setting the stage, understanding those climate risks and opportunities and how they impact not only your financial um, disclosures, but also beyond that, and how they can have a financial, material financial impact on your organization. Um, then, to, or not tomorrow, uh, the next week, I think it's the 29th, we're getting together again. Um, we're going to do TCFD 102. So we highly encourage everyone to participate in both the training sessions. Um, in the 102, we're going to look at what does this look like in practice. So today's kind of like the theory. And then our next session is really uh, the implementation of the practice. What does that look like um, when we put that in our disclosure? So in the 102 session, we're going to be building experience in climate-related financial reporting through um, examples, and we pull all of those examples from the TCFD Knowledge Hub, which we'll be sharing how you can make use of that throughout this training as well. Um, and then the TCFD 102E also makes use of that TCFD Knowledge Hub, where you can find a number of self-guided online learning. So the learning doesn't end after um, our next session. You can continue to learning about learn about all these topics, and you can dive into certain topics that might be particularly uh, more relevant for you um, as you're moving through this journey. So um, after our 102 session, Evan's going to share with you how you can um, continue that learning journey with the 102E sessions. So uh, we have a few objectives today that we would like to um, achieve with all of you um, uh, for our 101 session. So the first uh, key learning objective today is to help you be able to explain what are financial risks and opportunities that are associated with climate change and why are those important uh, to our financial disclosures. Uh, we also um, look to help you to understand what are the key elements of climate related financial disclosures and be able to outline um, at an initial phase uh, what are characteristics of good practice, what are the disclosures that we want to see um, pertaining to climate. And then finally help you to identify those initial steps that organizations need to take in order to implement the recommendations of the TCFD or as we also often say align our disclosures uh, with the TCFD recommendations. Um, so you can already see in the chat there's um, a link to the TCFD Knowledge Hub. That's a resource we will reference a lot. Um, another re reference that will um, provide you often is this SSE model guidance. We developed this with um, all of our partners also involved in this training. Um, that that links also. So in your chat box now. Um, so we're going to use this model guidance throughout. Um, it's kind of a good overview um, as you're getting started on this topic. But today we're going to focus specifically on chapters one and chapters two. So chapter one of the uh, model guidance really looks at um, setting the stage for climate disclosure. So as we uh, mentioned, uh, kind of what is the reporting landscape? What is the regulation? Why are we trying to move forward on these um, topics? And then chapter two is really um, digging deep into those risks and opportunities. So what are these risks and opportunities related to climate? Um, in our 102 session, we'll then uh, dig deeper into chapter three and four. So at the end of the session, if you'd like to review, I highly recommend uh, then reviewing chapters one and two of the SSE model guidance. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna um, launch a quick poll here. Um, which uh, really just aims to give us a, a little bit of an overview, overview of where all of you are at in your reporting journey. So there's no wrong answer here. We just want to understand a little bit about where you are all at on this journey. So let us know, are you an expert on uh, TCFD and, uh, and climate disclosures? Are you confident, but you need uh, to understand a little bit more about certain key elements? Do you have um, the basic knowledge, but you need further support to continue on your journey? Or do you have a little to no prior knowledge? And with that, I'm gonna pass over to my co-host, Evan, who's gonna take you through the first session. Over to you, Evan. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tiffany. And thank you 
for joining us today to learn about this topic, which is only really continuing to grow in, in relevance and importance to, to companies and to government for our world. Um, so I'll just give everyone another second to fill out the poll. But from the results I'm seeing so far, it does look like the vast majority of you either have little to no prior knowledge or have some knowledge but need support. This is great. This is fantastic. We're here to learn. So please do ask questions along the way. Hopefully we can uh, clarify anything, um, any questions that you might have wondered coming into the session today. Uh, and for the, the one expert of you, uh, please do uh, share your knowledge along the way if you are indeed a, an expert. But hopefully all of us can be at a more confident level with our understanding of the TCFD recommendations after these two trainings. In this next section, I'd like to go over the context for climate-related financial disclosure, specifically the imperative for action on climate change, why it matters for business, why it's important for financial stability. We'll go over the concepts of climate-related financial risks and opportunities and why disclosure to investors on the subject is needed. The imperative for action to address climate change has become um, very widely understood. Um, the reason for which was made uh, clear in the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's Assessment Reports, and actually uh, the IPCC is uh, releasing new reports, updated reports, and the message has stayed the same uh, with the, the reports being late, released today as these previous ones, which um, the IPCC really synthesized all of the science and research that has been done on climate change. And, and these ones and, and the one today unequivocally point to the fact that human influence has warmed the Earth's atmosphere, ocean, and land. And specifically, human activities have already caused at least on average 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming since pre-industrial times. Global surface temperatures are expected to continue continue to increase until at least mid-century under all of the possible emission scenarios that are considered. Uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and two degrees reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decade. And even with just to 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming, it's evident that the impacts of climate change are already being felt globally. On the next slide here, we'll see um, a number of news stories from around the world um, in Africa and around the world really showing these impacts already being felt in a number of different ways. And that there's really a growing demand from society for more ambitious action and policy to address climate change. It's also these impacts and these changes are also increasingly feeding through to the business sphere, with businesses increasingly seeing that climate change is, will, and can have um, a real and tangible impact on business performance. It is also feeding into uh, global and systemic understandings of risk as well. Um, so for the fifth year in a row, uh, the World Economic Forum has assigned environmental risks, including uh, climate mitigation failure, climate adaptation failure, as and we see here extreme weather as well, um, top, top global risks. And this is from the, the 2021 report, World Economic Forum report, um, but in the most recent report as well, it's this trend of climate risks dominating top global risks has only continued. Um, as such, climate change and the impacts it will bring are increasingly one of the top issues that businesses must address. And as such, it poses a uh, significant risk to the stability of the financial system as a whole. In 2015, uh, while governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney made really a landmark speech on this topic, um, on breaking the tragedy of the horizons. In this speech in 2015, he hi highlighted that despite these severe and systemic threats from climate change, 
the time horizons for both policymakers and financial markets are just too short to start taking the necessary action to address the issue. This observation then really paved the way for the establishment of the TCFD to help address this issue and to really help companies and financial markets take a forward-looking approach to climate change. Although it's important to note that the TCFD was very much developed from a, a financial perspective and not uh, an environmental one, which we'll get into in a, in a bit more detail. Climate change will pose significant risks, whether it be physical risks uh, through floods, through wildfires, through um, worsening soil conditions, or transition risks through um, changing regulation, consumption patterns, et cetera, to most, if not all, organizations, whether it be in the short, medium, or long term. Equally, there are significant opportunities as well, and these really need to be worked through and considered as part of an organization's strategic planning and risk management processes. The action or inaction that uh, companies take on these issues will have a financial impact, whether it be on their position, performance, or future outlook. And that's all really to emphasize that climate change is a risk like any other business risk and therefore should be treated and reported in the same manner as other risks faced by organizations. Uh, some of the types of risks that companies face um, are here on the slide, we see uh, asset impairment or changes in the useful life or, or fair valuation of assets, uh, increased costs or reduced demands for certain products and services, uh, provision and contingent liabilities arising from fines and penalties through stricter emissions regulations over time, uh, and changes in expected credit losses for loans and financial assets. However, when talking about climate change, we, we do often focus on the risks, but um, climate change also has the potential to create many opportunities for business. The, the, the transition requires drastic economic change. And while we'll focus a lot on the risks today, it's important to identify and highlight the opportunities of part of being the solution to addressing climate change. And an important aspect of the TCFD framing itself is to really ensure that businesses are identifying relevant climate-related opportunities and developing strategies to capitalize on them. So some of the potential opportunities for businesses that we see are growth and innovation through the development of products and services that contribute to uh, climate mitigation or climate adaptation, see reduced costs through improved energy and resource efficiency, see companies improving their reputation with um, employees, customers, and other stakeholders who are increasingly having higher expectations around companies when it comes to climate. We also see uh, companies really ma managing climate risk and uh, really helping them to be proactive, more resilient, and ready for any future business disruption. And together, this can really help ensure that your business is fit for growth and to thrive in a rapidly changing economy. At this point, you might be wondering how significant these opportunities really are. And just to give you an idea, in 2019, CDP um, conducted an analysis of global responses to our climate questionnaire of thousands of companies. And we published the findings of this analysis in the 2019 report, which identified 970 billion dollars in potential risks that those companies were facing, but at the same time, 2.1 trillion dollars in potential opportunities. And so this shows that while both are significant, the opportunities we're seeing companies see are actually significantly outweigh the risks. So hopefully now we're a bit clearer on climate-related risks, climate-related opportunities. Um, so hopefully we, now we can sort of ask 
what information is really important for companies to disclose and to report on when it comes to climate? Well, there are two main perspectives on a key element of corporate climate reporting that is called materiality. Information on a company can be material if it is um, considered um, reasonable, uh, reasonably important uh, information or the would be important to a reasonable person, and particularly um, in the setting of a reasonable investor information that they would want. And so you can see in this diagram taken from the European Commission's guidance that there are two key perspectives on materiality. On one hand, we have single materiality, which focuses purely on the effect that climate risks and opportunities can have on, uh, it, on the company and its bottom line. And then the second perspective, on the other hand, is double materiality, which focuses both on the effects of climate risks and opportunities on the company and its bottom line, as well as the impacts that the company has through uh, its activities and operations on the climate itself. These are both uh, slightly differing perspectives, but both very important perspectives for businesses to consider when they're uh, thinking about what are real issues for them to report on to their stakeholders. But we're here to talk about, about the TCFD today, and so the focus really is uh, with the TCFD on that first perspective. That is a perspective of single materialities that helps companies to identify and develop a risk management approach to the risks and opportunities that the company faces itself, not necessarily about managing the company companies impacts. Um, now, the two concepts can be interlinked. And for example, uh, the material uh, company's impacts on the planet can be financially material. So um, for example, consider a company with significant greenhouse gas emissions and thus a significant climate impact. The introduction of some sort of emissions regulation or carbon tax can suddenly be very costly for that company. And that is um, can be considered a climate transition risk that will have a financial impact. So a materiality analysis of, of what could impact a company is really critical here. Therefore, it's really important to emphasize that what we're not talking about is alignment. Uh, while it can be really important for businesses to develop set targets and develop transition plans that align their strategies with uh, national or global decarbonization targets, such as uh, setting a science-based target uh, for net zero aligned with the Paris Agreement. This is distinct from a company's own considerations of the risks and the opportunities that it will face from climate change. And so what's really important with TCFD is to think about how climate change is going, going to impact um, financially impact your company. At this point, you might still be wondering, why, why should I care about this issue? Why should I particularly start implementing the recommendations or considering the recommendations of the TCFD? Well, one of the key principal reasons is that investors are increasingly using climate-related uh, disclosures to inform their investment decisions. And Investors are really the primary users of this climate disclosure information. And so full and coherent disclosures on these material climate risks and opportunities that businesses face really allow investors to um, do a number of different things, including aligning their own financing with certain uh, climate goals. Investors are increasingly looking to invest in businesses that are sustainable, and that are, for example, aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And reporting is how you communicate um, to your investors the action that you're taking to both build resilience and potentially mitigate, um, mitigate your impacts over time. It also helps investors to ensure that risks and opportunities that companies face are correctly priced into their valuations. Investors want to understand what risk companies are investing in are exposed to, and particularly what they're doing to mitigate those risks. 
And here it's really important to re-emphasize all businesses are exposed to climate risks in some way or another. And so it's important to show that you're aware of this. Um, and we'll discuss, Tiffany will discuss this a little bit more later on in terms of key challenges. Um, it also helps investors to allocate capital efficiently by using this climate related information in their standard evaluating process. And lastly, it builds on um, established approaches to wider strategic and financial disclosure to capital markets. Now, while the TCFD is really designed to provide tailored information to investors, it doesn't just offer investors benefits. Um, reporting on these climate related risks and opportunities can provide uh, listed and non listed companies a range of internal and external benefits as well. Um, so, some of the internal benefits that we see for companies going through this process of TCFD reporting is. Um, cost savings through identifying certain opportunities for resource and energy efficiency that might not otherwise have been identified. We see companies improving their overall strategic resilience. Uh, we see companies identifying potential uh, climate-related financial opportunities, um, improving their overall risk management processes, and improving communication between board and management on climate issues. Some of the external benefits that we see for companies are improved access to capital, improved engagement with their investors, the companies ensuring that they're prepared for any emerging climate regulation, which has been coming very quickly in many jurisdictions around the world. Um, we see them improving reputation with uh, customers, employees, and other broader stakeholders. And lastly, going through this process of climate reporting and TCFD reporting can really help companies establish a leadership position among their peers and set themselves out within their sector. Now we've already covered uh, a fair bit of ground um, this afternoon. So I might just pause to see uh, if everyone's following along and that I'm clear there should be a, a poll coming up. The question of the poll is, uh, which of the following are examples of climate-related financial risks? Uh, you can select multiple here and select all that you think apply. So the options we have are reduced demand for products and services, increased costs due to extreme weather damage, uh, lower costs due to reducing energy consumption, and higher rates of taxation due to carbon pricing. Uh, I'll just pause for a moment to give everyone a chance to fill that out. In the meantime, Tiffany, do we have any questions that have come up that are worth uh, addressing live for everyone? Well, we haven't had any questions yet, Evan, so you must be um, incredibly clear in your explanations. Um, but I will remind everyone, if you do have questions or if any of this may be even an acronym you don't understand or um, something that you'd like us to elaborate on further, um, we're here live with you. So if you do have any questions, we're, we're happy to take them. Just pop them in that Q&A box. Yeah, please do ask any questions and maybe maybe we can test whether I've been clear with this poll question here. <laughs> uh, just give everyone another moment to fill it out, though. All right, perfect. Indeed, uh, it does look like it's the case that I've largely been clear, which is great. Uh, most of you got these, which is, is fantastic. So um, which of the following are examples of climate related financial risks? So we have three correct answers. So for those of you who selected three, that's great. Uh, the first one, uh, reduced demand for products and services. Absolutely. Um, this is an example of a, of a transition risk. Uh, we have increased costs due to extreme weather damage. The majority of you got that. That's great. That's a, an example of a physical risk faced by a company. Um, and then higher rates of taxation due to carbon pricing. Uh, most of you also got that, which is great. This is also a, an example of a, of a climate transition risk. So great that you got that. Uh, a few of you did select that third one, which is lower cost due to reducing energy consumption. Uh, that's an important consideration for businesses, but it's not a risk, right? It's it's uh, the the inverse. It's the opposite. So we're 
we're looking at a climate related opportunity there. So in going through this process of TCF reporting, it's really important to sort of distinguish it between those risks and opportunities and how you might communicate that in your financial reporting. Hopefully that's clear. Happy to pick up any questions from that. Um, but I think based on the answers, I think we're clear enough to move on to the next section, which. Hey, Evan, really before, you, a, yeah. before you move to the next section, we did get a, a little question in the chat wanting a bit more clarity on single double materiality. Do you mind just covering that quickly one more time? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I think single materiality is really just looking at we know um climate change is particularly the, there's two two particular aspects for for businesses so those physical risks we're already seeing a lot of those those physical risks whether it be extreme weather or worsening crop yields all these sorts of different extreme those risks thinking about how those risks risks are going to impact you, are impacting your company, and are going to continue to impact your company over time as climate change gets worse, and particularly looking at those risks and impact, but also on the transition side, as we said, might be changes in consumer behavior. So single materiality is looking at those physical, looking at those transition risks, and how they might impact you, your company, sort of over the long term. The double materiality is, encompasses that, but then also takes a step beyond Bond, as it says, uh, companies also contribute to the issue of climate change. They they emit, they have greenhouse gas emissions, and those emissions then contribute to the risks that we're already considering. And so it's that broader looking beyond just the risks and opportunities to the company itself, but the impacts that the company has on the climate itself, um, which maybe over the long term can be financially material as well. So it's uh, looking beyond those immediate risks and opportunities to the company itself at the impacts as well, I think is the key way to really distinguish between single and double materiality. And it's a, a totally fair question to ask. It's often a, um, a, a tricky, tricky one to fully understand, but hopefully that's clear and um, can provide more examples if uh, anyone has any follow-ups from that. Perfect. So having really established the importance of climate risk disclosure for business uh, in this next section, I'd like to sort of go over the global and local reporting landscape and how you might really try to understand it. So we've already um, established that climate change is an important issue for investors and business, but we're also seeing that this is really accelerating into major changes in standards and policy and regulation around the world. Um, but before we go into that, we have another poll which should be coming up. The question is, which of the uh, following frameworks and standards do you currently use to report on climate? Please select all that you think apply. Uh, so we have CDP questionnaire. We have the SASB standards. We have GRI standards. We have integrated reporting framework, uh, CDSB, and other. I'll just pause for a second while everyone fills that out. Maybe one thing to mention while everyone's filling this out, um, we're talking about the TCFD today and it is not on here. So why why is that the case? And I think that's because um, a couple of reasons. One, TCFD is sort of why we didn't include it here is TCFD is actually really fed into a lot of these sort of frameworks and standards. And so seeing some of the you report, and so for example, some of you, um, report to the CDP questionnaire. If you're already reporting to the CDP questionnaire, a lot of the information, as well as the SASB standards here that we see a number of you, if you're already reporting to those frameworks and standards, you're already likely gathering a lot of the information that you need to fully um, fully start, start aligning your disclosures with the TCFD. Um, so that's just great to see that so many of you are already using some of these different frameworks and standards because you are likely already uh, sort of well on your climate disclosure journey and gathering the right information as uh, will give you a bit more further guidance about how to take that information that you're already capturing and integrate it into your TCFD reporting. Um, so within the disclosure space, one of the 
particular initiatives to be aware of is the ongoing collaboration between these different sustainability reporting organizations. Um, all of the sort of acronyms or the alphabet soup that people often uh, groan and get upset about because it's so sort of confusing. Um, I think the important thing to say, and I'm really glad to say, I think this landscape has started to drastically simplify over the last few years. And we at CDP, together with our colleagues from some of the sort of main standard setters and disclosure frameworks, have really worked towards simplifying and integrating this landscape. And you'll see some of the outputs sort of charting some of this um, work by this group on the slide, which have aimed to show how these different organizations' tools and resources and standards can be used to provide consistent and reliable ESG information to a range of different stakeholders. In December 2020, a particular paper was released on reporting on enterprise value, the paper that focused on those standards that support organizations uh, reporting on their enterprise value to investors within their financial report. This is particularly getting at that single materiality that how does this matter? How does this impact enterprise value? And this gets at exactly what the TCF is looking to focus on as well. And so with the TCFD, we're particularly, and I'm, we'll mention the ISSB in a second here, but we're focused in that red box of going beyond connecting financial reporting that uh, many might be used to with sustainability related financial disclosures. So that's where we're really focusing on. Perfect. So the TCFD recommendations uh, have been welcomed all over the world. Uh, they've become a sort of quite a widespread um, framework with over uh, 3,000 companies having become official TCFD supporters. Um, and while the TCFD recommendations were initially designed to be voluntary, uh, governments around the world are coming to the conclusion that a mandatory approach is necessary to ensure the uptake um, of the recommendations really at the pace and scale needed to safeguard markets from climate-related financial risk. Uh, so a number of different uh, jurisdictions have already uh, and regulators in certain jurisdictions, for example, in Brazil, in Egypt, in uh, New Zealand, Singapore, or uh, Switzerland, United Kingdom, uh, the EU, the US, we've seen climate disclosure regulations being introduced and most of them being based on the TCFD disclosure framework. Um, but what's important to sort of really highlight is that this, I, uh, the, the TCFD reporting um, is really feeding into um, a global standard for climate disclosure. And the work on international standardization to really simplify and create a baseline of climate reporting is being led by the IFRS Foundation. And so in November 2021, the IFRS Foundation announced the creation of a new International Sustainability Standards Board that was tasked with developing a comprehensive baseline of high quality sustainability disclosure standards. And as you can see here, um, the ISSB um, has sort of four strategic focus areas, one being sort of investor focus, creating climate disclosure standards that provide an investor focus. ISSB will take a broad sco scope around sustainability, uh, starting with climate, but considering other areas, it looks to create a global baseline and builds on existing frameworks. So as I mentioned, really building on the work that has been done by some of those other organizations that you're already reporting to, and especially the TCFD. We go on to the next slide here, we'll see um, that the structure of the ISSB requirements is that we'll have sort of general requirements, which it has already released as well as requirements related to specific themes and industries. And so from the ISSB, we've already actually seen the first climate standard. This climate standard is in the process of uh, being finalized and has recently announced that it will become effective in January, 2024. Um, so that climate standard is already being finalized. 
we'll see other themes being developed. But what I'd like to particularly draw your attention to is the ISSB really builds its disclosure requirements for the general and for climate on four key pillars. There are pillars of governance, companies' governments, a company's strategy, companies' risk management, and a company's metrics and targets. And these exact four pillars are the pillars pulled from the TCFD itself. And so as uh, Tiffany will get into more detail on this, but it's really important to mention that if you're already reporting to or looking to report to the TCFD, you're really preparing yourself to also uh, disclose in line with the um, uh, ISSB standards being finalized. Um, one other important thing to really mention, oh, maybe just go to the next slide here, actually. Um, perfect. Yeah, one other important thing to mention, in addition to the sort of developments of the ISSB, really looking to create this global standard for climate disclosure, is uh, the work of the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. So the TNFD is looking to sort of um, follow upon the work that was done around the TCFD, but to take a broader look around nature-related disclosures, even considering climate, but going beyond to consider issues related to ecosystems, biodiversity, areas of water. And so the TNFD is developing a risk management and disclosure framework for organizations to understand and report on nature-related risks, opportunities, dependencies, and impacts. Um, and this is set to um, be finalized, um, the TNFD, by uh, September of this year, but there's lots of ways to get information and to engage. So please, if you're interested in better understanding the TNFD, uh, check out these the links that are uh, included in the presentation here. Yeah. But on the topic of the TNFD, on the next slide here, we'll see that the key thing to emphasize is, again, we're seeing sort of the pattern here. TNFD is looking to really focus on four core pillars. So those are the pillars of governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And so this builds and is fully sort of aligned with the TCFD. And so the sorts of processes that you need to put in place within your organization, within your company, um, to set up TCFD reporting will really help to prepare you as well if you go to look to do uh, reporting and understand your nature-related risks as well. Perfect. And then we can sort of zoom out from the sort of global picture to have a look at the sort of what's going on in the region. Particularly, um, it's important to note that the um, Nairobi Securities Exchange requires ESG reporting for listed companies. Uh, the Capital Markets Authority published a co uh, code of corporate governance practices for issuers of securities to the public in 2015. Uh, listed companies here are required to explain in their annual reports how they have applied the recommendations uh, that are contained within the code. And then lastly, the Central Bank of Kenya produced guidance, which applies to uh, institutions li licensed under the Banking Act on climate-related risk management. So some of the key things um, to show what's actually going on um, in Kenya and how this connects to the global reporting landscape. We're seeing this sort of push and movement towards climate disclosures all, all, all around the world. Um, so with that, I'll stop there and I'll pass it on to Tiffany to actually take us through, uh, I've been speaking about the TCFD for a long time to take us through what the recommendations actually are. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Evan. So hopefully now we kind of have set the scene of why we have the TCFD, but let me just um, introduce briefly um, kind of where it came from and uh, why it's getting so much traction globally. Um, so just as a reminder to everyone, um, the TCFD's uh, recommended disclosures were developed in order to really help um, in identify the information that was needed by investors, by lenders, by insurance underwriters, really by the financial system in order to appropriately assess and price climate-related risks and opportunities. And what do we mean by assess and price? We really want to understand um, what are those impacts going to be on a company. We want to understand um, maybe how risky a company is, um, if we're going to invest in them. 
when we're going to make that assessment of, of deciding where we're putting our money as investors, we need to understand how climate's going to impact these companies. And investors were really struggling to do that because there wasn't enough information about how companies um, were themselves um, addressing these risks and these opportunities. Um, so as Evan mentioned before, um, these these recommended disclosures really came out of the financial system itself. It was the central bankers that started it. Mark Carney, a central banker, was really kind of the driving force behind it. And now we're seeing um, kind of a push from all directions. So initially, um, they were uh, developed to be voluntary recommended disclosure. So they weren't meant to be mandatory. Um, however, as Evan mentioned, increasingly, Governments are deciding we need to move faster, and they are making um, alignment to these recommended disclosures or um, transparency around these items um, that the TCFD recommends uh, mandatory uh, globally, um, uh, country by country, uh, making that decision. Uh, I think it's important to note that it was developed to be voluntary um, to begin with, which means that it's it's able to be adapted to any uh, any country. So it doesn't really matter what your uh, your requirements are locally. You can make use of these recommended disclosures, whether they're mandatory or not in your in your particular uh, region. And also as mandatory um, regulations come about, those also differ um, from one country to the next in terms of what is made mandatory. Um, but because of the voluntary nature that these were developed in initially means that they are um, applicable globally. Um, so um, the second point here is that they um, were developed in order to report climate related financial disclosures. And we've highlighted that word financial in that second point there, because that's really the key there. What we're trying to understand here is what investors are trying to understand is that financial impact um, that climate will have on organizations. Now, if we're going to make that connection between climate and finance, where we really want to see that information is in our, our annual report together with our financial filings. If we want to see climate and finance um, and how they connect, we need to see them together. So that's a really key point of the, the TCFD is really focusing on how to get this information together with our financial information. Um, they were also, the third point there, they were also developed um, for um, particular um, sectors um, who were seen as more risky, um, and, and those sectors were provided additional guidance. So the financial sector, as well as high-risk non-financial sectors, have been provided supplemental or additional guidance. So we're going to talk today about 11 recommended disclosure from the TCFD. Now, if you are in the financial sector, which I noticed quite a few of you were actually, um, or if you're in any of the high-risk non-financial sectors, which we'll discuss momentarily, you have you know a few more um, recommended disclosures because your sectors are particularly unique or particularly high risk. So we'll discuss that momentarily. Um, they also um, look at specific risks and opportunities. So Evan's already discussed what is a transition risk, so our transition to a low carbon economy uh, versus a physical risk, which is those weather changes um, at, and the opportunity. So the TCFD really highlights key uh, physical and transition risks and opportunities that all companies should be evaluating. And they list them out for you. So it's really important that companies are making use of those um, lists of risks and opportunities and uh, ensuring their company's resilience vis-a-vis -vis those risks and opportunities. And now in order to ensure uh, a company's resilience, that next point is a scenario analysis. So that's a tool that you can use um, to identify how resilient a company is vis-a-vis um, -vis those uh, risks and opportunities moving forward. Now, Evan said a few times that those risks often aren't you know, uh, uh, coming through maybe next year or the year after, but longer in the future. So we need to you know, uh, maybe understand what's going to change um, 10 or 20 years down the line so that our company strategy isn't one that's going to um, uh, cause us to um, go bankrupt in a couple of years because we haven't foreseen these risks or opportunities. So the scenario analysis is a really great tool where we can look at various scenarios. Um, so making sure it's not just one scenario, we're not predicting the future. We're saying it might be a scenario where there's 
um, you know, a quick transition to a low carbon economy. And there's as such, you know, fewer physical risks, but quite a few transition risks because there's changes in policy, there's changes in our energy mix, there's changes in consumer preferences. How do we understand how our company will survive and thrive in that scenario? Or another scenario might be the opposite where, you know, there's not so much transition risk. We're not moving very fast. There's not a lot of policy change, but as a result, we have a lot of physical um, changes. So um, that might mean um, large portions of the globe are now underwater. So are your assets in some of those places? And are you prepared for those high physical risks that we might see? So that scenario analysis is a really useful tool um, that we will probably comment a lot and we'll dig a lot deeper into in our next session. Um, also, as we were just commenting, uh, the time horizon is very different for um, climate risks as some of the other risks we may have been looking at um, as an organization. So really um, needing to identify um, these um, impacts on a short term, a medium term and a long term time horizon um, is really key to the TCFD. And then the final point here um, is that we have both qualitative and quantitative disclosures. We always get asked in these trainings, how do I quant? And I think we've already have been asked, how do I quantify these? How do I understand um, really in dollar terms, um, the financial impact of these risks and opportunities? And that is certainly key to understand that. But as we're talking about short-term, medium-term, and long-term, a lot of this is really understanding um, maybe more qualitatively how we're going to react to that. So that's putting in the correct policies, putting in the correct procedures, making sure our risk management is robust enough moving forward. And those aren't necessarily quantified. They're more qualified um, disclosure. So um, more discussions about what we're going to do to mitigate or adapt to these circumstances. Um, so uh, we, I, I mentioned that there were certain um, sectors that had additional guidance. Now that usually leads to the question saying, you know, who should disclose the, then? There's these financial sector groups and there's these non-financial sector groups. Um, does that mean if I'm not in one of those groups, I should not disclose this information? And the answer to that is certainly no. Um, actually, the TCFD developed these guidance for all organizations. And um, their, their you know, strongest recommendation is that all organizations with public debt or equity should certainly be recommending these uh, recommendations. However, because of the interconnectivity of listed companies um, with uh, their supply chains and companies that might not be listed, um, it is important actually that all companies start to identify their own risks and opportunities because those in their supply chain, they might be the, the people they're procuring from or to, you might be selling to another company are now having to understand the risks all around them and understanding how the other companies they interact with might be prepared or not um, to these risks and um, particularly their emissions where we're doing a lot more reporting on emissions now and that requires us to understand the emissions of all the companies we work with as well because those become um, risky to us as well. Um, so just to note, however, those that do get additional guidance um, are those financial sector groups, so banks, insurers, asset owners, and asset managers, and then also the non-financial sector groups, energy, transportation, materials, and buildings, agriculture, food, and forest products. So if you're in any of those sector groups, you will have additional um, recommended disclosure. So above and beyond the 11 that we discussed today, um, then the, those particular um, sectors have a few more um, recommendations. And those are directly in the TCFD's recommended disclosures. And there's um, plenty of guidance there on how to follow them. So another key aspect um, that we want to make clear before discussing those 11 recommended disclosures is where should those disclosures appear? Now, I hinted at this already, um, it's really a key aspect of the TCFD, and that's that this information should be um, appearing together with your other financial information. Um, as I said before, the TCFD is looking to make that connection between climate and finance, so we need to see that information together. Also remembering that it's investors that are using this information. Um, it's really um, to provide this information for the financial system as a whole. So we want it to come together with that same reporting package that we, that we provide to investors. So the objective of the TCFD is really to provide this information um, together in our annual or mainstream report um, uh, in, uh, to get together with our financial information. 
Now, a number of companies have started by providing it in a separate report. So a TCFD report, a climate change report, something like that. We're seeing a lot of that, um, which is fine if that's not your end objective. So making sure um, that your end objective is to pull this information into your annual report together with your financial information, because that makes you go through that, that mental exercise also of understanding what is the financial impact? Where in your financial statements is this going to hit you? Is it going to be in your balance sheet? Is it going to be on your revenues? Is it going to be on um, early retirement of assets? Really understanding that financial impact that climate will have. Um, and the TCFD does give a lot of guidance on that. So I've already thrown a couple um, references in the chat, and I highly recommend making use of those as you're trying to understand um, how a, a climate-related risk and opportunity will financially impact your organization. Now, a key aspect of why the TCFD really highly encourages this is because then this information also is subject to the same governance processes and sign-off as your financial report we often get a lot of questions about um, legal aspects. What are the legal risks of um, disclosing this information publicly? Um, and what about greenwashing? Um, can we be accused of greenwashing if we're um, providing this information? So the key here is if you're providing the recommend recommended disclosures that the TCFD says, so that really gets to what are you actually doing as a company? What are you doing to ensure that you're prepared for these risks? And that single materiality aspect we talked about is it's not necessarily looking at, you know, what you're doing for the environment, which will come around to um, in the end, but really understanding how you're prepared for the impact the environment will have on you as an organization. That makes sure that you're really um, having an honest and clear conversation with your report users that um, is not um, a greenwashing discussion, but rather it's an honest discussion of what processes and policies your company has put in place, what targets you're really setting to ensure that you are achieving um, this um, a mitigation or assessment of risks to ensure that you're going to thrive and survive in the future as you move forward. So once you have those um, in, that information in your annual report, um, your board has to approve it. Um, so it should be information that you um, stand by and that you um, as a holistic company really believe in and are acting on. Um, and then the final point also, um, it makes sure it's accessible to the primary users of this information, which is investors. If you put this information on your website somewhere or in a separate climate risk report, the investors um, that are investing in you might not see that information, which means they might assume that you're not prepared for these risks and these opportunities, and they will consider you a, a riskier company and might um, divest from you. So it's really important that you're providing this um, in an accessible location where investors are going to see it. Um, and so the TCFD also developed a set of principles. Um, so when you are disclosing this information, um, you should be um, disclosing them along with uh, or in alignment with these principles. Um, however, many of you um, in, from the financial sector might be uh, already familiar with a lot of these principles. If any of you are an accountant, um, you'll, you'll be familiar with most of them, actually, because they align um, directly with the, the financial accounting principles that you'll already be using. And I like to highlight them because when people struggle to understand how do we put this information together with our financial information, you'll see that actually we're asking you to um, provide information in alignment with the same principles we use for our financial accounting. Um, so just for an example, you can see the first one there is to present relevant information, um, which is the same as IFRS principle three on relevance for financial accounting. Um, and then if you're using US GAAP principles, number four there to be consistent over time is the same as US um, GAAP principle number two on consistency, and all of them align with our financial principles. So just making sure that we're providing you know, all the information that the TCFD recommends, um, but doing it in a really relevant and consistent and balanced and verifiable way, um, making sure that investors really get the sense that they need about how you are um, addressing these risks and opportunities. So with that, um, let's do a quick quiz um, just to see um, if everybody is still following along. Um, so I'm just gonna launch now and it should um, pop on your screen momentarily. So. Um, this is a quiz, uh, true or false, um, the TCFD recommended that disclosure should be made um, within a standalone, so a separate climate risk report. Is this true or is this false? I'll give you a moment uh, to fill that in. 
And in the meantime, I see somebody has asked in the chat, is there a standard template uh, for climate risk assessment? Um, yes, that's sort of what the TCFD is really. So the TCFD does um, list, as Evan was mentioning, certain risks and opportunities that you want to be assessing um, as an organization. Um, and they want all companies to be assessing these particular risks. So as Evan mentioned, we have the physical risks, uh, which can be acute or chronic um, risks. And then we have those transition risks, um, which is that transition to a low carbon economy. So we can have policy and legal risks. We can have technology, market, uh, and reputational risks. And so you can use the TCFD's um, guidance to look through all of those risks, risks, what's associated with them, and then identify how that impacts you. Does it impact your operating costs, your write-offs, your research and development, um, capital investment, et cetera. And then the same thing with opportunities. Um, let's not just think about risks but also on the opportunity side, um, the TCFD risk, uh, lists specifically certain opportunities that companies should be assessing, such as resource efficiency, energy resource or energy source, products and services, markets and resilience, and then again, how those um, impact you financially. Now that gets you started. It's a good template to um, in initially start with. Um, but then of course, as you're doing a scenario analysis and digging deeper, you might find other areas of impact related to climate. Um, so I'm going to end this poll now and uh, share the results and uh, congratulate the majority of you. So 73% of you got that right. Um, so indeed, the answer is false. So the TCFD does not recommend um, disclosing this in a separate report. You might do that if you feel like you have particular stakeholders that are particularly interested in this. Um, a lot of oil and gas companies, for example, are doing this because they recognize the reputational risk of not addressing climate change. They know that they need to discuss this with their stakeholders. So they, they create very you know, robust and, um, and, and long reports on climate. Um, however, if your company doesn't um, feel that you know, large reputational risk at stake, um, then where we want to see this information in is in the annual report, is pulling that into your annual report. Okay. And then someone says, please share the TCFD template. Um, Vanina or Evan, can you just drop the TCFD recommendations right in there? Because it's, um, it's right in the recommended, um, the, the TCFD document itself. So um, that Evan or Vanina can drop that in there for you. So let's go through these um, recommended disclosures themselves. Now, um, Evan um, kind of uh, already introduced these briefly. Um, and if you remember from a few slides back, um, there was an onion diagram we had where there was governance on the outside and then we moved inward. So governance really kind of is how we oversee and frame everything else. And it's really important that it's seen as kind of the overall structure within everything, uh, where everything else is set within. Now, the TCFD um, has two recommended disclosures in the pillar of governance, uh, the first being uh, to describe the board's oversight of climate-related risks and opportunities, and the second being to describe the management's role in assessing and managing risks and opportunities. So really two key aspects here to understand. We want to know how the board is overseeing these risks and opportunities, and then we want to know how the management um, is managing these risks and opportunities. Um, so here we often see a discussion and it's very much qualitative normally in terms of committees, um, processes, timelines, how are these discussions taking place within the organizations, any policies that are set, um, how we ensure that um, there's continuity on this topic and that it becomes business as usual. Now, where we might move into more of a quantitative side is um, we might measure um, here, which we'll talk about more in the metrics and targets, but um, we might understand how remuneration is integrated here and how um, the incentive structure um, in our organization ensures that our, um, our governance, our board, as well as then you know, our CEO, our C-suite, our managers are incentivized to identify these risks and properly uh, manage them. So then the second pillar um, of uh, the four core pillars is strategy. Now, uh, two things to remember here that, of course, none of these pillars should be seen in silos. They all really interact together. Uh, the other one is to um, notice that on this slide we have here bolded um, that it's subject to a materiality assessment. 
We didn't have that on the governance side, and that's because the TCFD deems governance as well as our next pillar, which is risk management. These two, governance and risk management, are really process oriented. And if we don't act on those, if we don't put in place those processes for governance and risk management, then we will have a financial impact because climate change will impact all organizations. It's a non-diversifiable risk. Um, so governance and risk management, all organizations can already start putting that information in their annual report. Um, whereas strategy, and then our last one, metrics and targets, both have a materiality assessment attached to them. So what we want in our annual report is those um, aspects that are deemed to have a financial impact on our organization. So the first recommended disclosure in the strategy pillar is to describe the climate related risks and opportunities that the organization has identified over the short, medium and long term to have a financial impact. So we might have in our risk management process gone through and, and evaluated various different risks and opportunities from climate. We've gone through those lists of risks and opportunities that the TCFD has um, provided. And then we've identified which ones will have um, a material financial impact on organization in the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Now, it's likely that all of those risks and opportunities identified um, by the TCFD will have an impact on your organization, but at different time horizons. So it's important that you understand when those impacts will um, come to fruition. The second um, uh, category of uh, disclosure, uh, strategy B, is to describe the impact of climate-related risks and opportunities on the organization's business strategy and financial planning. So A was what are these risks and opportunities and in what time horizons? And B is what is that impact? What is the financial impact we're expecting to see? Which may start um, qualitatively. We might just say, you know, we, we expect this risk, a change in market behavior to impact our revenues um, and change our strategy perhaps. Um, but over time, you'll get more and more more detail, and you'll be able to quantify that and understand exactly how much of an impact you're expecting. And then finally, um, category C under strategy is that um, component that we talked about using a scenario analysis. So in um, strategy C, we want you to describe the resilience of your organization's strategy um, over time, taking into consideration different climate-related scenarios, um, including a two-degree scenario or lower. Um, so that's where we're going to use that tool, the scenario analysis. We're going to um, look at two or more scenarios in the future, and we're going to try to understand how our strategy as it is now um, will um, serve us as an organization moving forward. Now, just to note that the TCFD in 2021 um, did provide some updated um, guidance to companies. So um, in the strategy component, we got a few updates. They're listed here on the slide, so you can go over them um, yourself. Um, but just to note, none of them changed the disclosures. They just provided additional um, guidance. So for example, if you're in the banking sector, and I saw a few of you are, um, in strategy component one, which is identifying what are those risks and opportunities, the TCFD provided a kind of an expanded definition on what it means to be exposed to carbon-related assets. So now you have additional guidance and additional formulas in the TCFD's um, recommendations and in that guidance document you'll get in the, in the implementation guidance that comes with it additional guidance for banks on how to move forward with that. I also see someone asking what are the key updates in 2023 it has not been updated since so we had the guidance come out in 2017 we had updates in 2023 and then we just get more guidance documents coming out every year I guess and what we're waiting on now is um, the ISSB which the International Sustainability Standards Board which will be our next kind of guidance on climate related disclosure building off of the TCFD. So then uh, risk management is the next pillar. Um, so as you see, that materiality assessment um, line has disappeared here. And that's because, as I mentioned, like governance, risk management is really about the processes that we have in place, um, making sure that we're going to be uh, appropriately addressing these risks. So the three disclosures we want to see here um, are first and foremost to describe your organization's processes for identifying and assessing climate-related risks and making sure that in that identification process, you are addressing all of the risks um, that the TCFD has identified, as well as those opportunities um, which link to your strategy. Um, and then in um, the second recommended disclosure, we want you to describe your organization's process for then managing 
those climate related risks? How are you going to mitigate, adapt, address these risks that you've identified? Um, also in that second component there, we wanna understand that prioritization. How do you determine which risks you're going to prioritize? And then in the, the third component in C, we want to understand how your process for identifying, assessing, and managing the climate-related risks is integrated into the organization's overall risk management. Now, keeping in mind that climate risks are different than other risks, but specifically for their time horizon, but also how they um, impact different geographies differently, but then are also interconnected. So uh, there might be polluting in one region that it will impact other regions more significantly, for example. So it's important to understand as an organization how climate risks might be slightly different, but then um, how you prioritize those with your other risks. And a number of companies will already do this. So it's just making sure you're communicating um, with your um, audience, with your report users, how you're integrating climate risks into your holistic risk management process. And the final pillar, I realize I'm a bit off time, but hopefully um, we'll get through these last couple of slides and you'll get a break in a moment. Um, metrics and targets. So that's the final pillar. It's in the, the very center of that onion diagram, but keeping in mind that that all these pillars need to be interconnected. So metrics and targets also has that materiality assessment. We want to understand those uh, metrics and targets related to the risks and opportunities you identified in the strategy component as having a financial impact. So whatever you are discussing from the strategy component, if you're um, fulfilling those disclosures in strategy, those same risks and opportunities should be measured and you should be setting targets for those. So the first, um, the first uh, recommended disclosure in this category is to disclose those metrics that you've um, used um, to assess climate-related risks and opportunities in line with its strategy and uh, risk management processes. The second one um, is um, uh, particularly of those metrics, we want to see your greenhouse gas emissions. So those GHG emissions and the TCFD recommends making use of the greenhouse gas protocol in order to measure those emissions. And um, the GHG protocol provides a number of free tools that you can use in order to uh, measure your emissions. And then we want to um, provide our scope one and two emissions. So those are really the emissions you have the most control over. Um, and then it, and at least assess your scope three emissions. And that's your value chain emissions. So they can be harder to identify. The GHG protocol gives a lot of great tools that you can use to start identifying your value chain emissions, your scope three emissions, but they're also where the majority of your um, emissions lie. So it's important that you understand the risks uh, related to um, your value chain emissions. Now, also to point out that B, the GHG emissions, the, the TCFD considers that um, material to all organizations. So while in this category, we say that it's all subject to materiality assessment, um, B is considered material for all organizations. So all organizations are recommended to disclose um, uh, their scope one and two emissions. And then finally, C is those targets. So describe the targets used by organizations to manage climate-related risks and opportunities and performance against those targets. Now, in um, 2021, when we got that update, um, we did get a few kind of additional guidance um, points on these um, areas as well. Um, one, one important one is on that scope three. So in B, that box B, um, the TCFD really re-emphasized and really um, made a bit more clear that scope three emissions are certainly very important uh, for risk assessment. So all companies really should be providing scope three um, disclosure if possible. Um, and then um, they, for both metrics and targets, they provided a little bit more guidance for metrics. Um, they provided um, kind of seven key, I think it was seven um, key cross industry metrics that all organizations um, should be providing. Um, and then they also um, provided um, a, a bit more guidance on setting targets specifically because a lot of of these targets can be a bit further in the future than we're used to working on. So investors need to understand how you plan on getting there. If you're setting a net zero target for 2050, 
what's your plan um, to know if at 2040 you're on target or not, um, especially because when we're talking about reducing emissions, sometimes um, it happens really quick at the start and then the last mile is really difficult or vice versa. It depends on your industry. It might be, it might take a lot of investment at, at the front end and it takes a while to get things moving, but then at the end, a lot of emissions disappear very quickly. So it's not necessarily a linear process. So we need to understand how you're planning on getting um, from today to your target that might be set um, 10 or 20 years in the future. So just a reminder, kind of pulling that all together in one screen, um, we have four core um, pillars here, but they're all very much interconnected. Um, so the governance is really that board oversight and the management oversight. Um, the strategy is understanding those the, the material impact of those physical risk, transition risks, and the opportunities. The risk management is, again, those processes in place. How do you identify, assess, and manage uh, those uh, risks and then integrate them into your holistic risk management process? And then finally, metrics and targets. Um, how are you measuring those physical risks, transition risks, and opportunities that you've identified as having a, a financial impact on your organization? And what targets are you setting for those? Um, so someone was asking about the updates um, with the TCFD. So here's just an example of what we saw for updates. Um, I did discuss this one already, so I'll leave that with you to look at. But then in addition to updating the uh, recommended disclosures by providing additional guidance, they also launched, <coughs> pardon me, additional guidance documents. Um, so there's the 2021 implementation guide, which is really useful and I've shared already in the chat box. Um, and then we also have the 2021 um, um, uh, metrics and targets guideline, which again, if you're looking at that financial impact, um, that also gives you a lot of great guidance there. So you can get all of this either on the TCFD Knowledge Hub, or if you go to the FSB TCFD um, website, you can also access all of these new guidance documents. And I'll leave this with you um, to review on your own time because I've gone uh, way past my time allotment today. Um, but just to note that the TCFD is um, very much um, becoming a global uh, standard practice um, as of February 2023. More than 4,000 companies um, have um, indicated themselves and communicated with the TCFD that they are aligning their disclosures with the TCFD. Um, and we're seeing, you know, a number of companies progress on this um, every year. Um, so you can access that, uh, the latest TCFD status report to see maybe how your region's doing or how your sector's doing when you get these slides. And so with that, before one thing holding you back from your break, I'm just going to um, give you one more quick quiz and see who, um, who was following that discussion, who's still awake. Um, so we've just discussed four core pillars of the TCFD's recommended disclosures. Can you uh, note which are those four core pillars? So two of them are incorrect. And I'll give you maybe just 30 seconds to fill that out. Evan, I see we have a few questions. Is there anything you wanted to address live? Oh, maybe not. Well, um, Evan will answer um, the one on how different is TCFD from a CDP questionnaire, um, given he's from CDP, but um, just a, a preview, they are very much aligned. Um, and then how does, someone else ask, how does the TCFD impact on stock exchanges and what are the common examples from stock exchanges in the SSE? So that one's for me. Um, I'll answer that one now. Um, thanks, David. Um, so the TCFD, uh, well, I guess the stock exchanges themselves can answer, but what we're finding is that stock exchanges are um, providing additional guidance um, to companies um, on this disclosure. And in particular, uh, they need to be providing um, information to their to their list of companies on how this aligns with their local regulation. So that's what we need to understand is the kind of connection between the local regulation, what's required. Um, but um, we also have been um, monitoring kind of year on year, uh, the amount of emissions um, that we see in, uh, in a stock exchanges listed companies. And it's also important for a stock exchanges perspective to understand kind of how climate's going to impact all the companies on their uh, on their market and how that might lead to um, companies uh, going bankrupt in the future, which would mean obviously less clients for them. So there's kind of a holistic view of this, of how it impacts stock exchanges. It, it impacts them as organizations themselves, also looking at 
climate related impacts, but then it also provides kind of, it, it leads them to need to provide a little bit more guidance, which is why we're here um, helping you with that training. Evan, did you want to answer um, how TCFD uh, differs from the CDP questionnaire? Yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry about that earlier. Happy to come in on that. Uh, um, so I guess the first thing to say is uh, to sort of connect some of the dots here. So CDP's questionnaire is pretty well fully fully aligned with the TCFD. So if you're completely filling out um, and aligned with CDP, um, you're gathering all a lot of the yeah aligning your disclosures with with. TCFD. CDP also has recently announced that it will be aligning its disclosure questionnaire, building on its alignment with TCFD to ISSB as well. So, so if you're thinking about ISSB, reporting to CDP can help you uh, disclose in line with the ISSB. I think the one difference is, is to note, or, or two differences to note on climate, is that CDP does ask additional questions above and beyond TCFD. And so while it's aligned with TCFD, there are additional questions above and beyond um, that um, investors through CDP ask companies to disclose. And so if you're filling out every every question of the CDP, you're filling out in line with the TCFD, but going above and beyond. And then the other the other brief one to mention, but sort of beyond this topic is CDP also asks questions on forests and water as well that go beyond uh, beyond the TCFD. So Great. those Thanks, are some Evan. of the key differences. Perfect. Um, so just to, before we um, let you go to break, um, congratulations, everyone. You did identify correctly. Uh, metrics and targets, risk management, uh, strategy and governance are the four core pillars, but they're always interconnected uh, for sure. Um, so with that, um, let's let everybody take a five minute break. So if you could return in five minutes, um, and then we will continue with our training from there. Thanks, everyone.
All right. Welcome back from the break, everyone. We might just dive right into it. Um, we're a little bit behind. So hopefully we can um, make up for lost time, but let's get right into it. So now that we really understand what the TCFD recommendations are, why they're important, let's get into some sort of practical steps for implementation. So before you even start trying to write your climate disclosure, you should really try to consider uh, processes within your organization's use to prepare, understand and prepare material information. Uh, try to use these existing processes within your company and adapt them where necessary. Um, this process is really about connectivity and we suggest considering how, how uh, these climate disclosures are, are connected to other information in your mainstream financial report and it makes it really about tying it back to tell your organization's story um, and it becomes a mutually reinforcing exercise. So Strategy disclosures tell how you have elected to respond to climate risks and opportunities, while metrics can tell you how uh, you may be performing um, against those um, responses, for example. Um, there's a few sort of key pieces of information on this checklist that are worth sort of keeping in mind as you go about your TCFD journey. Um, some key information to keep referencing around building on existing processes, connectivity, being balanced, starting with qualitative information. So it's good to have this TCFD checklist on hand when you're um, going about this work. One of the very first things you can do in your TCFD journey is to um, create a roadmap. Now, the steps of this roadmap will depend on your organization's respective starting point and context. Um, but this slide provides an illustrative example of what this might look like, which often starts by gathering the right uh, stakeholders internally to create a working group. You might then conduct a gap analysis of your, your current reporting to better understand where you currently are at and where you need to improve. As we mentioned, a lot of you, are, as we saw, a lot of you are already reporting to CDP questionnaire, FASB standards. So it's important to look at where you're at and then connect that to where you need to go to align with the TCFD. Um, the SSE's TCFD checklist, which can be found in the first annex of that model guidance that we shared, is a really great, uh, provides a really great gap analysis tool that you can use. Once you then identify those gaps, you can move through a process of capacity building and integrating climate related information into your operations. And finally, also your strategy for managing climate related risks and opportunities. In going through this process, you will quickly come to see that TCFD reporting is a whole of organization exercise. And in order to get a holistic picture of these climate related risks, opportunities, and the impacts they could bring on your company, you should consider uh, in forming an internal working group to help understand the issue. Um, working group that we often like to call a TCFD team. And the most successful approaches are where these, um, where this issue is tackled across an organization rather than in just one department. So ideally it should not just be a sustainability team, but also include uh, communications, investor relations, auditing, and others. As different professionals have unique expertise and perspective that can really improve a company's overall approach to understanding climate risks, opportunities, and then be reporting on them. We've seen a number of different approaches taken by companies, such as more uh, top-down approaches where senior leadership really direct the conversation. Uh, on the other hand, we've also seen uh, examples of bottom-up approaches where different functions within the business come together to develop a comprehensive plan. In either approach, you could really benefit from having a climate champion, someone preferably in senior leadership, or even on the board who understands the importance of uh, climate change and can really set the tone and lead on setting and approving your organization's strategy. Now, obviously, you don't want to start a bunch of new processes as that can be quite burdensome and time intensive. So it's important to leverage any existing reporting work or processes that you have. And in many cases, companies are not starting from zero um, as there are often internal 
information and processes in place. As uh, so, when you conduct your gap analysis of your existing disclosure, it's important to keep in mind. For example, are you already capturing climate-related data? How might this data be used for the purpose of TCFD reporting? Uh, for example, are you conducting life cycle assessments on your products? Uh, do you have a greenhouse gas inventory for your scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions? This type of information is really foundational to TCFD reporting, and you can really use this information to build out and understand any future risks and opportunities that exist throughout your company's value chain. In addition to this existing information, it's important to think about existing internal processes. So uh, what are already in place? Does your board, for example, already have a delegated sustainability or CSR committee that can include climate-related risks and opportunities into its oversight mandate? Or what are your existing risk management processes within your company? How might they be adapted to integrate climate change? Um, Understanding and adapting um, information collection processes and, and processes within the organization is really, really where it's important to start. And as we sort of have seen a lot of these frameworks that many organizations are already working with, whether it's CDP, CDSB, are feeding into the TCFD. And as I mentioned earlier, this landscape is really simplifying because the TCFD is then also feeding into the ISSB standard that's being finalized. Um, and this leads us to, for example, um, using CDP and CDSB um, together as an example. Now, uh, CDSB has actually been uh, consolidated into the ISSB, so it's informing sort of their work and their team. Um, but there's connections, um, specific connections between CDP disclosure and CDSB framework, um, and which will become uh, ISSB that can help you adopt TCFD. Um, and you can take a look at the building blocks paper at the slide that helps you, so that specifically maps this out and helps you to understand uh, these connections. But what's particularly important to emphasize is what you're integrating from. Uh, your reporting is the information that's financially material. Um, so that materiality analysis is really important to um, bringing in information from your existing reporting to align with the TCFD. So a first step, according to um, the TCFD recommendations, can really be about setting the foundation for your TCFD disclosure. So. To start with, the TCFD has recommended companies adopt certain, certain governance and risk management disclosures. And while TCFD is a full disclosure framework covering all four pillars, it uh, acknowledges and, and, and yeah identifies that it may take up to as many as five years for some companies to get to full implementation. So a phased approach can be appropriate and governance structures and risk management processes are a recommended place to start because they can be really used to incorporate climate into internal decision making and are therefore important to be thought of right from the very beginning of your disclosure journey. At this stage, it's not expected that companies give a very point by point granular demonstration of governance or risk management, but it's at least expected to outline some of the board's oversight, management roles, as well as the processes used to identify, assess, and manage uh, climate-related risks and opportunities. Once you have set that, put that foundation in place in phase two, companies can really look to enhance their disclosure by adding strategy elements that identify what risks and opportunities they're considering as well as which ones are financially material and what that impact may be on their business. Um, in, in addition to these strategies, disclosures being introduced in the second phase, you can introduce metrics and targets reporting, um, such as starting with scope one and scope two greenhouse gas uh, emissions and setting key performance indicators related to your emissions. Um, and you'll see here, while governance was 
key in phase one. Here you can really go further with your governance disclosures, for example, by determining how major capital expenditures may be impacted by climate related factors. So now at this stage, you've um, covered sort of risk management, government metrics and targets, um, strategy, the sort of four pillars. Um, but with this third phase, in, in the third phase that the TCFD recommends, you can really look to bring all of these together. So all four sort of pillars of the TCFD should be looked at at this, at this four, third phase. But the particularly challenging one that's left to recommend that the TCFD recommends to leave to last um, comes under that strategy pillar. And it's about building on those second phase enhancements by adding strategy resilience. And so this can be a challenging area. Um, and so with this, the particular thing to highlight is that this phase, this is where scenario analysis this really comes in and is quite important. So scenario analysis at this stage once you, once in phase two for example you've identified what those risks and opportunities are and the financial impact you have you should then start considering how those impacts and risks and opportunities may play out over different pathways and different scenarios as there's a lot of, uh, significant uncertainty of whether we will go down one scenario or another as as was sort of mentioned earlier and we go into We'll go into a lot more detail in the 102 session about how to conduct and go about the scenario analysis, but um, organizations like the IEA and the NGFS and the IPCC have given us science-based scenarios um, that we can use, that companies can use to really understand and assess their resilience and then build that into their company's strategy. And this is what's really critical in this phase three is to bring all the elements in, but especially the scenario analysis piece. Perfect. So gone over this three phase approach, I might just pause as a moment of sort of reflection to see um, what this might look like and um, think about your own organization's In a second, the question is what key action will you take next to progress? Uh, climate disclosure in your organization? Uh, will you establish a TCFD team internally? Uh, will you conduct gap analysis of existing reporting? Uh, will you develop a roadmap for TCFD adoption? Will you establish internal governance? Um, maybe you're like me and you're a case study learner and want to wait uh, until uh, you see the 102 session to make a, a Final final decision. That's totally fine if if you're in that last category. But uh, take a moment to fill this out. Let me just check. Don't see any questions in the Q and A. So it looks like hopefully we've been clear. Um, perfect. Seeing most of you already put in answers, and it's quite a mix, um, sort of all over the place, which is natural and totally expected um there's no correct answer here um totally depends on where your organization is at in this journey um but if you are indeed for example just starting from the very beginning uh these options are kind of listed in a quite a good order actually so um if you haven't started at all establishing that tcfd team is a really great place to start once you have that team really getting this work started you can then conduct a gap analysis to understand where you're at and where you need to go. And then once you've identified that, you can build out that roadmap to get to that endpoint that you ideally want to get to with full sort of TCFD adoption. And then you can look to build the internal climate governance, particularly the board and management level to really put momentum and resources behind your TCFD disclosures. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to, to Tiffany to take us through um, uh, interactive discussion exercise. 
Great. Thanks, Evan. And I hope everybody kind of understands now what the TCFD is asking of them and how to kind of get started with that in their companies. Um, what we'd like you to do is try to take all of that that we've discussed now and have a think about where you are at in your current um, organization um, and where the next stage might be um, and share that with us so that we also know kind of next next week how to uh, how to move forward with all of you. So um, we, we only have, uh, we don't have so much time. So maybe what we'll do is um, if you each just take five minutes to open up, uh, look online for your company's disclosure, um, your annual report, um, and try to identify where you might be, what phase you might be. And because we don't have much time, what I might recommend is maybe just looking at governance. So look at the governance um, a discussion that's happening um, in your annual report. So most annual reports will always have some form of corporate governance um, discussion included. Um, now, look at that discussion. You can look at either the CEO letter at the beginning or the, the letter from the chairman of the board or whoever might open up that annual report um, with some sort of discussion with investors. Um, and then you can also look into the corporate governance section of the report and identify whether or not climate is being discussed um, in any way. Um, and I'm, I'll leave this on the screen here so you see the three phases which we're focusing here kind of on the governance risk management strategy. Um, we didn't add the metrics and targets just because sometimes uh, that, that takes up a lot of space. Um, but of course, those metrics and targets are directly connected to your strategy anyways. Um, so take five minutes, um, have a look, look at your own report and let us know what phase you think you might be at. Um, and what challenges you might be facing to move um, to the next phase or even just to get started if you don't think you're at um, any of the phases yet. So we'll give you five minutes to think about that and then we'll have a quick discussion.
Okay, we'll discuss in just one minute. So if you have something you'd like to say about what phase you're in and why you might think that and how you can move to the next phase, uh, please put that in the chat now. We'll start in one minute. Okay, hey, thanks for those of you who have been sharing kind of where you're at, really interesting responses here. So um, just to discuss a few of the responses we've already heard, um, we we see the people who've responded are between, you know, phase one and phase two, and then maybe bridging on getting to phase three. So um, a lot kind of starting out, but moving forward, um, which is really great. And those who have participated are already starting somewhere. So we do often get some phase zeros in there. So it's nice to see that you're already kind of getting started on this. Um, now, um, one of the comments was um, that they're in phase one and they've captured kind of the, the idea of climate in their policy. And they mentioned that they also have it as part of their financing decision. So investors are requesting this information already from that company. So indeed, that's seeing, we're seeing that, you know, around the world that's happening more and more. So that's great that you started with a policy um, that really helps kind of frame it from the top. And that really ensures that the governance is on board. It's also great that investors are already requesting this from you because sometimes that conversation isn't happening between issuers and investors. And that doesn't mean that investors aren't using um, this information. It doesn't mean that they're not making that assessment already about your company, but they're not having that conversation with you about it or they're not asking for that information. They're just making assumptions that you're not prepared for it. So it's great that um, for that particular company, they are having that conversation with investors. And we'll talk more about that next time, how we really encourage starting that conversation with investors if it's not already underway. Um, another person said they're between phase two and three, that some aspects of both phases are covered, um, but there are some key areas that they really need to um, work on in order to get squarely in phase three. So really great assessment there. And that's such a common kind of description of where companies are at. We provide these three phases um, from the TCFD because it's a really great way to understand how each kind of um, disclosure can kind of build off of another one and that we want to have, you know, really strong foundations. We want to have, you know, a policy in place. We want to make sure that this is on the board's agenda, that, that we're starting to upskill the board and that the management's um, roles are in place um, from the beginning and then move forward and build on top of that rather than kind of going in the reverse order of setting targets before we have the policies um, in place. However, we rarely work on these, you know, in a very phased approach in terms of just starting in phase one on all, all the areas and then moving to phase two. So it's very common to move forward, maybe up to phase three on one of the, the pillars and they'll be working on um, phase one or two on another one of the pillars. That's perfectly fine. But what we want to make sure is that we're building um, bit by bit um, and making sure that we get the right foundation in place and the right policies and processes in place uh, before we're moving um, to, for example, um, do a scenario analysis or something a little bit more complex. Um, someone also said that they need a materiality assessment of climate related risks um, uh, to uh, clearly map their risks. Um, indeed, that's really core to TCFD. So I'm glad you're seeing the importance of that in this training today. Um, so moving forward with that, I really highly recommend using um, the links that are above in the chat to understand that financial impact um, that climate related risks and opportunities have on an organization. And then um, even if you're just starting out with a scenario analysis at, you know, the most basic level that really helps kind of think through how these risks will um, uh, come to fruition over time. Um, so on page 18 of the SSE's model guidance, um, that will help you kind of just get started with that scenario analysis, which can really help understand those material impacts over time. Um, and then um, someone also said that there's a strong commitment um, uh, and governance set up. So great. So really the foundation really is already started in that organization. 
but the commitment needs to be codified um, and potential impacts assessed. So I think that's the same thing. You're trying to understand those financial impacts and the materiality of this. So again, I would also look at page 18 of the SSE model guidance just to understand how you might be able to start using these scenario analysis tools, which really pull together the science to understand um, really from the physical side, how much rain we expect over time et cetera, um, to moving forward um, into those transition risks as well. So those tools will be very helpful uh, for both of you. Um, it's, it's really important to do that analysis over time because we often will make assumptions uh, in the future that might not be true to the science. So one example that I heard recently is that um, if you were to ask everyone in a scenario analysis of um, six degrees, so say we're going to look at what happens if the world reaches six degrees, and we're looking at a company that's a technology company that has servers in the desert. So how, how much impact do you think um, water would have and rain would have um, uh, or the temp sorry, the temperature would have on those servers in the desert at six degrees? And most people say, It'll be astronomical. They'll melt. There's they'll they won't exist anymore in the desert at six degrees. But actually, in a six degree world, we're going to have a lot more heavy rain in particularly the desert regions. So actually, um, by using the science, we can understand that maybe it's not the temperature we're so much worried about. Then it's flooding instead that we're worried about, and then we have to make sure that we're building those um, uh, the flood structures that are needed if we're going to head on a six degree pathway. So really using the science of those tools to be able to understand how those risks and opportunities might impact your organization. So we have uh, a little bit of time left and I want to make sure that you have um, the a discussion over um, our resources here. Um, so first we're going to start, oh, this is Evan. Evan, I'm going to pass to Evan, <laughs> who's going to take us through this. <laughs> Very happy to jump in here. So yeah, as Tiffany mentioned, lots of resources to help you you uh, you do not uh, need to tackle this on your own after this training. Um, there's lots of resources that can support you. So some key ones here, we have the TCFD implementation guide and good practice handbook. Um, these are really great resources to understand uh, sort of practical steps to implementing TCFD disclosure and give some sort of examples and case studies of what good practice really looks like. Um, we also have here the link to the TCFD Knowledge Hub, which is a great repository of all of the resources and guidance that's been prepared globally on the TCFD. Uh, you can use the database to search specific uh, core elements of the TCFD, whether it's more information around scenario analysis or uh, scope three emissions. You can also look into specific industries, specific geographies to find the resources that can best support you and your needs. Uh, we also have the SSE's model guidance on climate disclosure, which we've um, is a really, really valuable resource, and we've sort of mentioned throughout this presentation. So that should be really your go-to guide for all all of this. Um, next slide here. I'll just we don't have perfect. Um, we have a number of different um, additional market resources here. here all leave these for you to sort of review, but everything from guidance on climate-related risk management from the central bank to uh, the Nairobi Securities Exchange ESG disclosure guidance, a um, number of different resources that can really help you understand, uh, in addition to a lot of these global resources that we've provided, the sort of local conditions and local guidance and expectations. So please do have a look through these very useful resources that have been prepared by um, your exchange, the central bank, um, and those in your market. Um, and with that, I think um, I'll pass it back over to Tiffany. Or, or sorry, we have one more piece here. Sorry, one more piece. Our colleagues from the IFC weren't able to join us today, but even more guidance from them. Um, they have really great IFC disclosure and transparency program. Um, they're particularly their Beyond the Balance Sheet toolkit and platform just provides a really great ecosystem of of resources and reporting tools that can help particularly emerging markets to um, communicate key ESG information, including the climate information that we've gone over today. Um, they also have um, IFC personnel all over the world to support you and your needs uh, regionally as well. So um, we'll provide contact information in a second. I'll pass it back over to Tiffany. I think that's all the resources we have. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, thanks, Evan. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, we do next week have our TCFD 102 session, um, which what we're looking to do is to build a more detailed understanding of the TCFD's recommended disclosures. Those 11 recommended disclosures we introduced today, we now want to understand what that looks like in practice. Um, we'll also help you understand what good practice looks like through the discussion of various case studies, and we'll help you to identify the internal processes that are needed um, to overcome some common implementation challenges that we see. So as a reminder, that's um, next week. It'll be next Tuesday at the same time. Um, so we have four minutes where we have to close. Actually, I'll need one minute to discuss the, the survey. So um, we might have time for one question. Um, if somebody does have a question, um, you can raise your hand um, and we will go ahead. Um, in the meantime, while we wait to see if anyone raises their hand, um, why don't I discuss already with you um, the, the survey? Um, so if you would like to get your certificate of completion for this course, it is certified by CPD and you can get two um, professional development credits for it. Um, we do need you to fill out a quick feedback survey. Uh, Vanina is sharing a link with that um, to you. Um, on uh, in the chat, and it'll also be emailed to you um, after from Zoom. Now, you do need to complete the survey within a week in order to get your certificate, um, and um, it is through Google Forms, so sometimes you might have to use your phone if your organization does not let you access the Google Drive um, on your computer. Um, so you'll fill that in within a week, and then from one week of filling it in, um, we will um, send you a, um, a certificate please make sure to put your correct email address in there as well, because sometimes um, people uh, incorrectly add their email address and then they don't get a certificate. So um, please be careful when filling that in. Um, in the meantime, I didn't see any hands raised. So um, I hope that means that everything is quite clear and um, I'll move to the end then. And thank you all for participating in this training. Um, the presentation, someone said kindly share the presentation. It's been shared in the chat already. So maybe scroll up a little bit um, and you'll see the slides are in there. And then there's also a link. You'll also get a link emailed to you um, after the session. Um, so thanks so much to um, ISC and Bloomberg Philanthropies for their financial support in order to develop this training. And of course, to the NSE for hosting us today. Um, and thanks to my um, colleagues, Evan and Vanina um, for um, co-facilitating and working with us today on this training. Um, you'll see our contact details there as well. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Wishing you all a great rest of the day and we look forward to seeing you next week for the 102 session. Take care. <laughs>